Oh, I'm pleased that you could join me today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Please help me to explain it well. Uh, we thank you that your word gives life. And we pray, Father, that we will understand even more the life that you give to us through your son. Amen. Well, we're coming into the springtime soon and it's been a particularly cold winter uh, where I am in Tamworth. It always seems to be particularly cold. Uh, we've been uh, snuggled up around the fire in our lounge room most nights. We really need it. We freeze without it. And the electric blanket uh, in, on our beds was also particularly helpful to get through the nights. It has been cold and I'm looking forward to the coming of spring. Uh, for many people, they love spring because it's the time of flower festivals. Um, gardens revitalised, the flowers come up and people like to go and, and look at their terrific colours. There's uh, the Floriard Festival in Canberra and that's really well known and that's a big one. Lots of people go there. Kings Park Festival in Perth. Well, I won't be going to that one. That's on the other side of the country. Um, there's another big flower festival in Toowoomba up in Queensland, the Carnival of Flowers, and then the Tesla Tulip Festival in Victoria, and that's a bit far south for me. Uh, we've, we have um, some finches that live in our backyard, and last spring they decided to have a family. There's a little um, bird's nest that they've built under the eaves, and we're expecting them to come back and, uh, and we'll see, uh, see them looking after the eggs and eventually the eggs will hatch. And like last year, we hope to see some young finches come out and fly away. It's a wonderful sight. Seeing uh, spring is a great season just to get outside and see the world after the hibernation of winter. Spring is life. Well, today we come to the end of our studies in this letter to the Colossians and we end with a passage that reminds us that the gospel, God's gospel, is the gospel of life. In the winter of our lives, we were dead in our sin, we were totally lifeless, uh, we had no spiritual pulse. But now in the springtime, God has raised us up from the dead and we have been made alive with Christ. And we're going to be unpacking that today in this passage from Colossians 4, 7 to 18. Now, I hope you've got your Bibles with you please open them up it's a great passage to have in front of you and i encourage you to follow with me so we're looking at colossians 4 7 to 18 and we'll be cribbing back slightly in the verses 2 to 6 to draw the picture that the gospel is life gospel life is about people gospel life is about prayer and gospel life is about proclamation people prayer and proclamation and that's where we'll be today well gospel life is about people you can't miss it from the beginning of end uh, from uh, beginning from the end from verses 7 through to verse 18 our whole passage is about people and Paul has them listed there it's about how a remarkably diverse group of people have been brought together by the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And this diverse group of people have a, an affection and a love for one another and a real practical care and concern for each other. And as we look at how that uh, is teased out, the obvious starting point is the relationship between Paul and the Colossian church. Remember that these uh, two have never met each other and Paul hadn't been to Colossae and the Colossians didn't really know Paul, not face to face anyway. But this doesn't stop Paul from writing to this church and then asking that the Colossians would pray for him. And we find out uh, here in Colossians 4 that Paul intends to send uh, Tukikos and Onesimos I love those beautiful Greek names, Tukikos and Onesimos, so that the Colossians would be informed about Paul's situation and that they might be encouraged with the way Paul is being used by God to do great gospel things. So Paul wrote his letter to support the Colossians and now he seeks their prayerful support. 
Uh, more on the Colossian end of things, we also find out about the churches at Laodicea and Hierapolis, those, that cluster of three churches in the Lycus Valley. Uh, they were cl quite close to Colossae, Laodicea and Hierapolis, so the churches probably wrestled with similar issues. So Paul says, once you've read my letter to you, this letter to the Colossians, send you this letter on to Laodicea and take the letter from them and read it out to you. Uh, there is a little bit of uncertainty as to what this letter to the Laodiceans is, uh, whether or not Paul wrote it. It's most likely the case that he did. Uh, and has it been lost? Well, it may have been lost or possibly this letter was preserved under a, another name. It may even be the letter to the Ephesian church. Uh, I favour the option uh, that Paul wrote the letter. He's therefore confident of its content and he thinks it will be helpful to the Colossians over and above what he has already written to them. On the Paul end of things, and he's probably in jail in Ephesus, we see here that Paul has a group of fellow co-workers, people who share with him in the preaching of the gospel. There's Aristarchos, he is in prison with Paul, we see that in verse 10, along with Marcos, with Mark, and they both send their greetings to the Colossians. And on top of all that, in this diversity of people, there are some who are Jews and some who are Gentiles. Some of these people around Paul come from the upper reaches of society, some of them come from the lower reaches of society. So there's Luke uh, from the upper class, uh, he's a doctor, remember that? And then there's others from the lower reaches, such as Onesimus, uh, who's a slave. We, we know that Amasimos is in fact a runaway slave. He ran away from his Christian master Philemon, who also lives in Colossae. Then somehow Onesimos came into contact with Paul and he heard the gospel and this slave became a Christian slave. And now Paul is sending him back to Colossae as a brother in the Lord. There's this amazingly diverse group of people mentioned in the back end of this letter who, humanly speaking, have so little in common, but they've all been brought together by the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And there's also, we see, an affection amongst them. Paul calls, calls Tukikos a dear brother in verse 7. He calls Onesimos a faithful and dear brother, verse 9. And he calls Luke our dear friend, verse 14. He talks about how Aristarchos and Marcos and Justice have been a comfort to him. He talks about Epaphros, how he has been wrestling for the Colossians in prayer. There's a real genuine warmth and empathy in these relationships. One of the outcomes of the gospel is relationships which reflect the life of the gospel. Look, I'm sure out there there's some school teachers who dream of having a school with no students. Can you imagine that? A school with no students. How good would that be? No classroom chaos, no bad behaviour, no playground duty, no parent interviews or reports to do, no funding problems. I'm sure it's the same for doctors and nurses when it comes to hospitals. Imagine a hospital with no patients. How good would that be? No crowded waiting rooms, no emergency surgery, uh, no abuse, uh, no coronavirus to treat, no funding problems. I sometimes find myself dreaming about a church with no people, not this church of course, just other churches that I've been to. Just. Think about it for a moment. How good would that be? A church with no people, no pastoral emergencies, no deaths, no coronavirus safety plans, no conflict that needs to be resolved, no rosters and no preaching to be done. A church without people is absurd, isn't it? It doesn't make sense because the life of the gospel is all about people and life and reconciliation and the reordering of our relationships because fundamentally the gospel is about the reordering of our relationship with God. 
That is the immense achievement of Jesus' death on the cross, this reordering of our relationship with our Heavenly Father, that while we were still God's enemies on account of sin, Jesus paid our debt in full by his body broken on the tree so that by trusting in him, we can be reconciled to God and we can have our sins forgiven. The peace and the reconciliation that Jesus brings between God and us, that gospel life, also brings peace and reconciliation in our relationships with other people. Our gospel life is meant to produce within us a deep love and affection for one another, a practical care and concern within the family of God, a concern for each other, for one another's well-being. I think as a church... We do that pretty well. You know, we show practical love and concern for one another in so many ways. Uh, coming along to church is a great way uh, to show uh, and express our love and concern for each other, praying for one another. Uh, conversations we have not just on a Sunday, but our conversations all week. Practical support. This is gospel life working within us. Gospel life turns us away from ourselves and points us to the Lord Jesus. But when we take our eyes off Christ, it is so easy to drift back into self-centeredness. Gospel life is about people. So let's keep our eyes on Christ and do not tire in doing what is good. And then secondly, gospel life is about prayer. We saw this um, back in uh, chapter 4 verse 2, which we looked at. In some part, last week, verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Persevere in prayer. Persist in prayer. Set aside time for prayer. I want to stay in verse 2 for a moment because Paul describes how we should approach prayer and we didn't really talk about this much last week. He says, in relation to prayer, be watchful and thankful. It sounds like, Perhaps Paul is thinking of the false teachers that were plaguing Colossae. He's written to take the Colossians away from Christ. Take the word watchfulness. Remember back in chapter 2 where Paul said, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy. See to it. Be on the lookout. Be watchful. Be on guard against any form of teaching that will take you away from Christ. Devote yourself to prayer. Be watchful. Be alert. Be on the lookout for those who wish to steal the gospel from you. Be watchful and thankful. As we've worked through Colossians, thankfulness has been an important theme. We saw it twice mentioned in chapter 1, then uh, once in chapter 2, two times in chapter 3, and then uh, again now in our verse in chapter 4. Paul stresses thankfulness, and it probably has to do with the false teaching that was troubling the Colossians. We learn in chapter 2 that the false teaching would have the Colossians follow all sorts of rules, and it would have the Colossians chasing after all sorts of spiritual experiences, and it would have the Colossians chasing after all forms of different human traditions. This teaching would have the Colossians thinking that there is more that they must be doing to earn their salvation, to put themselves right with God, that there was something that they lacked, that Christ is good enough, but he is not sufficient enough to put them right with God. This is what the false teachers uh, would have the Colossians think, that Christ was a good starting point, but you need to go on. You need something uh, with greater maturity and greater force uh, to ensure that you're right with God. And so Paul has laboured to show that in Christ we have everything we need and in Christ we lack nothing. Uh, do Do you remember all the things that Paul has said about Christ through the course of his letter? That in Christ all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. That in Christ you have been given all fullness and freedom. That Christ has taken away the written code that was against us with all its regulations. He's taken away. He nailed it to the cross. In Christ we have all, uh, w- all the wisdom of treasures and knowledge. 
If we have Christ, we lack nothing. In Christ, God has met all our needs for salvation. And don't you think that is why thankfulness is so important in this letter and in our prayers? That in Christ we lack nothing, that in Christ we have the fullness of God within us. Um, what does thankfulness do? It directs your eyes to the things that God has given to you. Being thankful protects you from falling into the trap that there are things that you still lack or, or things that you need to do because Christ is good but he's not good enough. Thank, thankfulness reminds you actively that in your heart and in your mind, in your prayers, that Christ is all we need. And so as you pray, do you deliberately call to mind the things for which we can give thanks to God? For life, for health, for safety, for the energy to work and for all that is good in creation, flower shows. But most especially... Do we thank God when we pray for what he has given us in Christ? But prayer can be demanding and it's easier to do other things rather than pray. Perhaps this is why Paul uses the word wrestle when he says of Epaphras in verse 12 that he is always wrestling with you in prayer, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully mature or mature and fully assured. Uh, when I uh, see that word wrestling, I think of sumo wrestlers in a ring, you know, um, having to exert energy and force to, to battle with each other. It takes strength, time, effort and commitment to engage in prayer. We need to set our minds to pray and I think there's much value in praying well, with others uh, who can encourage us to continue in this task. We ought to be urging one another to pray and remembering that prayer springs from within us, uh, that prayer comes from the life that the gospel gives to us. We can bring our concerns before our Heavenly Father with the boldness of children who trust our Father to hear our prayers and to do what is right. There should be a naturalness, a spontaneity in prayer that speaks of a genuine relationship with God. And yet when Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer, it sounds like he wants us to be intentional about prayer and purposeful in the way we approach prayer. Uh, in his book, uh, A Call to Spiritual Reformation, uh, Don Carson works through Paul's prayers uh, in the New Testament. And along the way, Carson gives some great advice and, and his book exudes with wisdom. Uh, let me uh, give you an example, a, a quote. But after all the difficulties have been duly recognised and all the dangers of legalism properly acknowledged, the fact remains that unless we plan to pray, we will not pray. The reason we pray so little is that we do not plan to pray. Wise planning will ensure that we devote ourselves to prayers often, even if for brief periods. It is better to pray often with brevity than rarely but at length. But the worst option is simply not to pray, and that will be the controlling pattern unless we plan to pray. And so in his book, Carson looks at some of the reasons why we don't pray and some of the excuses that we give. We need to be intentional about prayer, uh, developing good habits, uh, and that's easy to do when we, or easier when we set aside time and when we pray together. And so devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And like Epaphras, wrestle in prayer as you commit your concerns to God. So the gospel is about people, gospel life is about people and it's about prayer and gospel life is about proclamation. That is, it's about the word of the gospel, the good news about Christ continuing to be spoken into a world ignorant of God's grace poured out in Jesus. And we saw this idea last week in verses 3 to 4. And pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I, I may proclaim it clearly as I should. 
And then we see the answer to Paul's prayer in the following verses. Even though the apostle is imprisoned, his prayer is being answered and the gospel is flowing out into the world. Paul has a, a ministry team around him and they are in the business with Paul of gospel proclamation. Uh, Aristarchos is one of Paul's travelling companions. Uh, Mark, Marcos, Mark, is also a gospel worker and a companion of Paul. Uh, Barnabas had a falling out with Paul and we uh, see that in Acts 15 but now they're working together Justice was the third Jew working with Paul indeed these three men uh, are the only Jewish co-workers that Paul has with him and it was Epaphras who originally preached the gospel in Colossae and who brought the news back to Paul uh, that God had planted a church there um, there's Luca, Lucas, Luke and Demos, Demos are also on Paul's ministry team. So Paul's, Paul gathers together a team because gospel life is about proclamation. Oh, did you notice here that Paul doesn't ask the Colossians to pray that he be released from prison? I think if I was in prison, that would be the first thing I'd ask. I'd be asking people to pray for me for, to get me out of this place. But Paul doesn't pray that. But he prays that a door would be open for the gospel. Uh, whether or not Paul is in chains for him uh, is relatively unimportant. But what is immensely important is that the gospel is not chained, that the gospel is not bound. Paul is outward in his thinking. And this is a real challenge for us. We can't withdraw from the world and step back into a Christian enclave. We cannot stay in a holy huddle. We cannot go there. The life of the gospel leads us in an entirely different direction. It leads us to go into the world, to live in the world, to engage with the world, to get alongside people who are living in this world. For now is the time um, when eternity can be won or lost. Now is the time when people can be rescued from darkness through the proclamation of the gospel and, and they can be brought into the kingdom of God. Now is the time when people can be reconciled to God and have their sins forgiven through the death of Jesus on behalf of them. And so we must understand the times that we live in. Now is the time to reach into our community, to reach into our world, to reach into our neighbourhood around us, the neighbourhood of West Hamworth. And so as we bring this series to a close, let's be reminded what the life of the gospel is all about. Gospel life is about people. Gospel life is about prayer. And gospel life is about proclamation. May the word of Christ dwell in us richly as we teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as we sing psalms and hymns and songs from the, from the Spirit with gratitudes in our heart to God. And whatever we do, whether in word or in deed, may we do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving joyful thanks to God the Father through him. As Dick Lucas says, so as Paul says farewell to us, we need to remember his fetters no more, for they have long since rusted away. But we do remember his encouragement to us, that in Christ Jesus we may enjoy fullness of life and freedom, and his exhortation to us, to fulfill any ministry that we may have received while there is time. Let's not waste time. Let's get out there into the world and share Jesus. For gospel life is about people, gospel life is about prayer, and gospel life is about proclamation. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you so much uh, that... You fill us with every spiritual good thing that our lives just overflow with the blessings that you give to us. Father, we, th we thank you that you call us to be your people and with that comes responsibilities as we live in fellowship with you and with one another. Father, help us to live a gospel life, to remember people, to share the gospel with them, to talk about Jesus,
to relate to the community. Father, help us just to think clearly about this world. Father, turn us into people of prayer. Father, we know what to pray. You tell us what to pray. Now move us to pray as we ought to be. And Father, give us wisdom to form a ministry team around us. For as a church, you have given us a commission. And we pray, Father, that as, uh, that as a group together, as well as as individuals, that we might see the great gospel of the Lord Jesus go into the world and so many people saved. And all this to your honour and for your glory. Amen.